Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Leaders to Learn From, Parents as Partners in Improving Student Achievement. My name is Allison Klein. I'm an assistant editor for Education Week. Today's webinar is being sponsored by Blackboard. We're lucky to be joined today by two high-flying district leaders who have been selected as Leaders to Learn From by Education Week. Both have done excellent work in the field of parent and family engagement and are eager to share our best practices with you. We're joined by Tracy Hill, Executive Director of the Office of Family and Community Engagement for the Cleveland Metropolitan School District in Ohio, and Patricia Spradley, Chief of Parent and Community Engagement for Springfield, Massachusetts Public Schools. Before we begin, now's a good time to review some of the technical aspects of today's presentation. Please check the audio setting on your computer as well as your speaker volume settings if you're having any audio trouble. If you're still having issues, please see our detailed audio troubleshooting file available in the handouts folder at the bottom of the council. There are some other icons that open with some additional features in our webinar console. You can read about today's speakers in the bio panel, click the handouts panel to download a copy of today's slides and follow the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag EWWebinar. Finally, an on-demand archive of today's presentation will be available in the next 24 hours. Both the archive and a free-to-download version of the PowerPoint slides will be accessible through edweek.org. And without further ado, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Patricia Spradley from Springfield. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, let me just thank Education Week for allowing us this opportunity to present to you all. So I'm from Springfield, Mass, as Allison just said. And today, I just want to go over a little bit about what's happening in Springfield. And so um, in Springfield, um, we have for quite some time looked at the difference between parent involvement and parent engagement. And so for many years, actually decades, the traditional kinds of things that um, happened in our schools were the parent conferences and health fairs, uh, regular workshops, and fun nights like math and ELA nights, and the uh, heritage festivals where um, families would bring their particular dish based on their ethnicity. And then we do some what we refer to as drive-by professional development, whereby there was not an awful lot of depth to the professional development, but clearly we were trying to at least begin the process in terms of enabling educators to understand some of the effective strategies on how to involve parents. But what we're really focused on um, currently is what we refer to as Parent Engagement 2.0. Um, and the difference uh, between involvement and engagement is pretty simply put in this way. It's easy to involve parents, um, especially if their children are um, performing in some way. You can get a parent to be involved because they are, always want to see their child. But engagement is much deeper because it really talks about a two-way relationship. And I oftentimes refer to it um, even as you courting. Um, when you're doing engagement, when there's an engagement piece, you're really concerned about um, that relationship and what it looks like, what it feels like. And you're always putting your best first. And so that deeper level of engagement um, in Springfield, we look at things like the home visit project, which um, we use some of our parent facilitators along with an educator to actually go into the homes of our students um, and to really get to find out from the parent firsthand about the child's needs and about aspirations that even the parent has. Uh, we also have things like the parent, um, for us, it's the Springfield Parent Academy, but you, I'm certain, have heard of academies and universities all over the United States in terms of a means and a way for parents and other caring adults to be able to um, participate in workshops, in our case, um, but really a means to educate, inform, involve, and engage parents. Uh, parent leadership training is very different uh, for us because 
we are not only trying to build capacity within families, but we're really trying to elevate and, and really bring about the significance of parent leaders, because our children need to see their parents and family members in leadership roles and places to aspire to. So we spend a lot of time on developing parent leaders. Um, then there's the community organizing, which is really critical because not just in an urban district, but in all districts, it's important to engage the community, one, from financial perspective, but also because it really does take a village to raise a child, but it certainly takes that village to also help us in developing and building capacity within families. So those linkages to outside partners is as critical. And when I say linkage to outside partners, it goes beyond community-based organizations to faith-based organizations, to employers, to businesses, um, colleges, and other institutions. Uh, the, systemic, um, the systemic professional development um, could potentially have even been at the top in that until or unless the district really wraps their head around and makes it a priority that there's professional development whereby educators really understand effective strategies and interventions for parent engagement. It's a, it's a sort of one by one type of endeavor and we'll never get to where we need to be. And then lastly, um, the PACE, which is parent and community engagement competencies as part of the evaluation. Um, has in essence happened through our evaluation tool, but certainly we're looking for moving forward that becoming an integral part of certification and even licensure. So that's really what's been going on and what we've been focusing on in Springfield. Um, in terms of that systemic family and community engagement, as you see in the bullets listed there, it's really focused on improving the core uh, work around linking this parent engagement to learning. We also want to make sure that there's alignment and coherency around the goals of the organization, that being the district and the community at large, and that we really need to make sure that there are a host of stakeholders that are involved in helping us to move and change our organization, and that parent engagement can't be a standalone and that we really have our work cut out in terms of changing the structures and the cultures that currently exist. Uh, so the impact of the family and community engagement when we're talking about stakeholders and the support for learning. Most of us have been made aware that when we have this kind of engagement, what we get are things like higher grades and test scores and um, improved and higher level programming. We really are able to promote more um, and, and opportunities for students to earn credits. We can adapt to more school and improve the attendance so that it's regular and we're not dealing with the chronically um, absent and tardiness that we are dealing with, I'm sure, all over. And that there's a great opportunity for better social skills and behavior. And so at the end of the day, we want to make sure that graduation is really the goal for all of our students. Now, for us, one of the game changers was really about the educator evaluation. And so there really wasn't anything that kind of fostered or even forced educators to really pay attention to parent engagement. And so I, I, I call it the game changer because right now in Springfield, and, and most other places, it's one of the standards that we really hold um, educators accountable for. And so I, I really tell them that it affects their pay. And so it's really important for us that the educator evaluation does what it does in Springfield and in um, communities around the country. So. As you see here, um, the implementation in Springfield, we did an awful lot of planning. 
Um, at the core of what we do is the professional development, but we really relied a lot on some existing things that were already there, like the PTA national standards, because for us, the Massachusetts fundamentals and those standards are the, I would say, the competencies like all of the core academic areas have. So that's our Bible, in essence. And then lastly, what I'd just like to say is that we're really fortunate to have um, some folks like the Karen Maps of the world um, who have helped us, along with uh, Arnie Duncan, to really come up with the family engagement capacity building framework. That the, the uh, form that you see up in front of you now is really the platform that I believe every district should really pay a lot of attention to in terms of what we currently deal with around the challenges, um, not only in urban districts, but suburban and rural as well, but the kinds of policies and initiatives that we must focus on in terms of looking at building that kind of capacity around staff and families that's absolutely necessary. And then looking at those conditions for success really enables us to figure out um, kind of like a I don't want to use the word framework because that's the title of it, but kind of a game plan, if you will, for those conditions that must exist if we're really going to change um, the significance and importance that parent engagement plays in student success. And when all of those things happen, the outcomes that are in that last box are absolutely where we can be once everyone understands their particular role in improving and leveraging parent engagement and understanding fully the necessity for us to wrap our arms around and our heads around effective strategies and ways to build capacity within parents and families so that they are true partners in the education that is so necessary for our students to be able to be successful. So I just want to thank you for allowing me these few minutes to share with you in terms of some things that Springfield is doing and encouraging you opportunities to have further conversations with me later. Um, and I'd like to, at this point, turn it over back to, I believe, Allison. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, and before we hear from Tracy, we've got a quick message from our sponsors, Blackboard. Thanks, Allison. Uh, so uh, I, I think many of you are probably wondering, uh, why is Blackboard um, a, a technology company sponsoring this webinar? And you can see here on the slide, uh, we've got our corporate mission and vision. Um, our vision is a world inspired to learn, and we see our, our purpose uh, to reimagine education. And at Blackboard, what this means for us is that we're dedicated to supporting learners throughout their educational experiences. And we know that, that learning begins in, in K through 12, and, and that parent and community engagement is key to supporting uh, success for both our students and our schools and, and to building strong communities. And, and so today, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, specifically some of the ways that we support that, but uh, pr proud to partner with EdWeek and to uh, support these leaders who you see uh, presenting to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Tracy Hill um, from Cleveland. Good afternoon, everyone. And again, thank you, Ed Week, for inviting Pat and I to um, co-sponsor or co-host co this, uh, this webinar. Um, what I'm going to be looking at specifically um, in my portion is how do we really authentically engage parents as partners? and um, looking at some of the core values. When you think about family engagement and putting it into effective practice in a district, um, you really must think about what are people's core values for family engagement. You know, I work in, right now, Cleveland Metropolitan School District, which um, is a city that is um, on the verge of a renaissance. You know, we have a lot of uh, great things going on in terms of the medical community and um, our sports teams, but also uh, in terms of family engagement, 
in our district as part of a, a, a more comprehensive plan called the Cleveland Plan. Um, as we think about um, educators actually authentically engaging parents in the different strategies that Pat described in her presentation, one of the things that we have to really stress is uh, the change in terms of values. What do people really value in terms of, of family engagement and why is it important? Um, this comes from Karen Mapp's work. Um, you know, she's at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and for the last 20 years has been doing uh, quite a bit of research, very comprehensive research and, and collecting all of the research around why family engagement is important to districts. But uh, at the core of it all is the values. What do we as, as educators value about family engagement and truly believe? So the first core value, of course, is that all parents have dreams for their children and want the best for them. Um, many of us on this webinar are parents. And when we think about the schools that our children go to, um, we want to be engaged at a level that really respects um, who we are and where we come from and the diversity of families, whether it be racial, economic, um, religious, or, or family composition. Um, the second thing is that all parents have the capacity to support their children's learning. Um, in Cleveland, because of our high poverty rate, a lot of people have a, a, a belief that parents in Cleveland do not care about the education of their children. So we have to change that core value in our staff and in our community. Parents and school staff should be equal partners in the education of children. Yes, that is a, a core value and belief when we're trying to do this work to transform our districts and move them to, to higher la levels of achievement for our children. Um, the responsibility for building these relationships um, between home and school rests mainly with school staff and leaders. Because what we know is that when you look at um, having it from a top down kind of strategy, it doesn't work. You know, the, the leadership of the district can believe that this the engaging families is important, but unless the school staff truly value that engagement, then we're not going to be able to move our schools forward. And that our community partners and stakeholders are valuable contributors to um, helping our students be prepared for the 21st century global economy. In Cleveland, as part of the Cleveland Plan, um, which is a reform strategy um, for our district, uh, we uh, d uh, identified 23 what we call investment schools to, pr to create community wraparound schools that utilize our community partners and um, agencies to support the learning of students in those schools and to help meet those families' needs um, at a very basic level. When we think about engaging with parents as partners, um, there's a lot of research, as I, as I alluded to, um, done by Dr. Karen Knapp out of Harvard, but also by different foundations and um, research uh, colleges of education. Um, the Flamboyant Foundation found that you know, there's a lot of research that shows that students do better in school when their parents are engaged and that educators only spend a very small amount of time with children, that we, it is imperative that we work with our families to build their capacity. Because we know that, and as Pat um, alluded to earlier, that when family engagement um, is a strategy for a district, that you have increased student achievement, higher graduation rates, um, better attitudes uh, of students towards learning, social skills and fewer conduct uh, problems, and that you have better student-teacher relationships, and improved cultural competence and trust in our schools. Um, House Bill 525 was actually a, a reform plan that was developed by Governor Kasich, our Republican governor of Ohio, and our Democratic mayor, um, Mayor Jackson, to help reform our schools. Um, this was a law that basically um, looked to uh, increase achievement in our schools by um, having very specific strategies towards corrective action. And included in the law was an accountability measure for parents, um, that parents, all of our students, 100% of our students would have a parent or guardian attend an event at our schools before December 15th of each year. Um, we have a parent uh, teacher conference committee that is comprised of district leaders, our, our 
teacher partners, our CTU representatives, and myself and other parents who actually take a look at what we're doing in terms of engaging our parents during conferences and coming up with a better strategy. Our parents in Cleveland are involved, contrary to popular belief, and we are striving to be better. So uh, we've been able to collect data using our student information system around the types of meetings that are occurring between parents. Um, we have some very good data, and we monitor it on a quarterly basis. But as of the, today, 83% of our pre-K parents have been to schools for face-to-face -face meeting, IEP meetings, open houses, um, and parent-teacher conferences, and what we call student support team meetings, where parents are called in to address social-emotional issues, but also to look at interventions that are being suggested for their child. Um, we had 82% um, rate in our combination K-8 high school. 68% in our high school parents, and then district-wide, our total for parent teacher conferences or face-to-face -face meetings with parents is at 78%. When we talk about engaging our parents, um, we, also, we, we have to look at the dual capacity framework. And again, Pat introduced this in her slides earlier, where we're looking at building the capacity of not only our parents to support student learning, but also of our educators. Um, you know, I, I was able to be a part of the White House Symposium um, last year on family engagement, at which Arnie Duncan and Dr. Karen Mapp introduced this framework. Um, and we talked about the need for um, the capacity building of not only our parents in terms of supporting student growth and achievement and doing things at home and in the community um, and at schools to support their students, but also about the need for professional development for our educators to be able to better um, engage our parents. As I said, in Cleveland, we have a diversity of families. 11% um, of our families in Cleveland are homeless. We have a poverty rate. Um, our, our schools, 100% of our schools, receive free and reduced lunch. Um, we have 25% of our uh, students on uh, who are uh, disabled or have IEPs, um, and 14% uh, of our families are ELL. So we have a lot of diversity in our district, and it's a changing demographic. You know, for the last 25 years, we've seen an influx of, of of families um, who do not speak English as a, as a first language, and also the poverty has increased in our, our, our city. Parents are choosing to go to different schools, um, charter schools and, and uh, Catholic schools, and, and we have a voucher program. So we, we continue to lose population of families and students because we, we have to focus on building the capacity of our family, of our educators, to be able to engage the population that is in our schools. Um, in terms of capacity building for our parents, you know, we developed uh, the Parent University. And our Parent University is um, held four times a year. Um, we work with our community partners and agencies to, con to um, conduct workshops on a vari variety of topics, financial literacy, um, college readiness. Um, we even have yoga classes, cooking classes, all kinds of classes that we uh, develop uh, and, and, and choose based on input from our families, our parent advisory committee for the district. Um, again, this is an opportunity for our parents and caregivers to sharpen their skills, um, to get information about um, their vital responsibility of, of encouraging their students um, to look at child development and uh, social emotional learning. And to date, um, since its inception in the fall of 2011, we've had over 5,000 parents and caregivers participate in our parent university. Um, we also do something called the Parent University College Bus Tours. And we've had over 900 parents participate in that since fall of 2013. We visited about 28 different colleges and universities within a four-hour radius of Cleveland. One of the things that we do, and I, I visited Boston and um, looked at um, the program that there, which was uh, created by Michelle Brooks, the 2013 recipient of the Leaders to Learn From Award, and um, looked at what they were doing. And we developed four strands for our parents. 
um, we, in terms of building capacity, we need to think about building uh, the capacity of parents as teachers, you know, in terms of understanding development for children and the types of things that they can do at home to support learning. Um, parents as advocates. Um, we are working with our parents to be able to uh, advocate at a state and federal level in terms of the legislation um, that is being proposed for budgets um, at the state level and the biennial budget and also at the federal level in terms of No Child Left Behind and Title I. Um, parents as learners, we provide workshops, uh, like I said, for stress reduction, like yoga and cooking, um, and also uh, uh, programs and, and workshops um, on, on the latest in terms of the computer software and technology that we're using in the district to support our students' learning. And then, more critically, parents as leaders. Um, we meet with our parents on a monthly basis and provide workshops and, and, and work with them on developing their leadership abilities. We have 103 schools in Cleveland, um, so we have a, a, different, a diversity of parent organizations at each school. We have PTOs, we have parent advisory committees, and then we have an organization called the School Parent Organization. Um, we are looking to re-implement PTA in our district, and again, are just looking to develop the leadership uh, capacity of our parents to not only work with um, the educators and advocate, but also to reach back and bring other parents into the fold as we uh, continue to develop the plans to reform education in Cleveland. Again, our parent university bus tours um, just provide an opportunity for our parents to experience college with their scholars. Um, many of the families in Cleveland, uh, or students I should say, um, if they go to college, it will be their first, they will be the first in their families. Um, when, I, when we developed these tours, we thought about, you know, many times our high schools were taking the students to colleges to explore that opportunity, but neglecting or not offer, offering that opportunity to parents. And we know that, the research shows that for students who do not have um, parents who are actively involved in this process of selecting colleges and applications and um, completing the FAFSA in a timely fashion, that their likelihood of getting to college without that family support is, is, is lessened. So we developed this program to help um, parents and students have a vision for what that college experience would look like and also know the logistics of getting there. Um, some of the work that Dr. Karen Mapp has done um, has also identified the different roles that families can play. So as we talk about capacity building for not only parents but educators, um, we have to think about how we can work with our families to be better supporters of their children's learning experience, you know, to, to kind of have the educators back when the student isn't turning in assignments or adhering to some of the, the expectations in the schools. Um, we need to have our families be encouragers um, and help them to um, help their children have a th positive self-image and a can-do spirit. Um, we have to instill in the belief, the belief in our children that we believe in them. So as educators in the classroom are encouraging their children, so should families at home be encouraging their children to do their best. Monitoring their children's time, you know, I talk about this a lot when I do presentations um, in terms of my level of involvement in my son's school right now. Um, because of the nature of my work, I'm not able to be at the school every day, um, but I am able to monitor his grades and attendance via an, an online grade book. So as we think about building capacity, too, we have to also um, help our parents um, utilize technology and realize that many districts do have online grading systems and, and um, apps that they can access student information. Um, we have to model, um, help our parents model lifelong learning. And when parents um, engage in um, learning experiences themselves, either going back to school to get their GED or going back to college or participating in the activities at the schools, um, and workshops and, and the parent universities, um, our students get to see that their parents are models, that they are continuing their learning. Advocates, again, we are focusing on this area in terms of, you know, when parents come to school off sometimes, you know, they might come with a, a certain approach. 
So we have to work with our families on how they can negotiate the school system, helping them understand the policies and procedures um, in terms of special ed, um, ELL services. Um, in our district, we, again, have a lot of homeless families. How do they advocate those, those services and, again, advocate better for their children, that they are decision makers and choosers, um, that they are included on our school improvement teams and design teams and then collaborators, that they work effectively with school staff members um, and also members of the community to access resources and, and get the things necessary to help their children achieve. I guess the last thing is that you know we, we, we've seen great examples in Springfield and Boston and, 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 and in the growing evolution of our work in Cleveland around family, family engagement from parent-teacher conferences and really um, using that opportunity when you have parents in front of you to uh, help them understand their role in, in their children's success. Um, to the parent universities and college bus tours and, and all of the great things that are happening, you know, we, we have to remember and, and value that all families do have hopes and dreams for their, for their children and that we really have to take that to heart to move this work forward and really get everyone from the, 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 the superintendents to the custodians to the bus drivers, everyone um, who is working in schools and touching our scholars and our families has to value this work and be a part of it. And I'm going to turn it back over to Allison. All right. Thank you so much, Tracy. And thanks to both of you for those um, really insightful and inspirational um, presentations. Um, we're going to move to Q&A now. I'm going to start with questions that were submitted uh, by folks in the audience before this webinar started. Um, but you can submit questions to our guest speakers in the Ask a Question box. Um, which is located beneath the audio panel and right above the chat window. Um, so our first question is um, one of the pre-submitted questions. Um, someone wanted to know if you all can suggest systemic ways um, to shift educators' practice within districts and schools. And I know you spoke, you both spoke to this to some extent in your presentations. Um, this person wanted to know how we can convert educators who see parent engagement um, as an add-on, um, an unpaid responsibility, or um, an ATM machine um, for school funding priorities? How do you change those attitudes? Um, and I'll start with Pat um, to answer that question. Well, actually, I believe that one of the systemic shifts occurred with the institution of the educator evaluation, which you know clearly has the specific standard, the family and community engagement included. And at bare minimum, it's you know, directly tied to educators' salaries. So it's at least a start. And the district has the responsibility of clearly defined roles, but most importantly, the implementation of those roles. So we have our work cut out for us, you know, with educators who still view parent engagement as an add-on. Um, a parent is and will always be the child's first educator. So I believe that until or unless we get to the root of why educators don't understand the impact this has on student success, you know, we won't be able to make the kinds of educational gains required to improve public education. You know, building parent and family capacity is a must. It's not a should we. It's a must. Uh, Tracy, did you have anything to add to that? Well, yes. I think, you know, we also have in our district developed the, the teacher development evaluation system. And there is um, one of the indicators that is for family engagement. I think as we look at, you know, the, the Again, in our district also, the evaluation is tied to salary. So um, being an accomplished teacher, you receive um, additional salary um, for your, your work in the district. Um, what I think we have to do is more clearly define what artifacts or evidence of, 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 of educators' um, efforts to engage families um, is. You know, is it just a call log to families? to you know, speak to families about the things that are going on and provide progress updates? Is it uh, a home visit? Is it a visit in the community? Is it participating in the family events uh, that are happening at the school that are linked to learning? One of the things that we're doing in Cleveland, um, and I'll say 50% of our 103 schools, have what we call family engagement committees where they sit down and they develop their Title I action plans for family engagement around the data around with their students. You know, it's part of their academic achievement plan. Um, so that we're looking for very, um, again, authentic 
um, opportunities for families to come in, understand student data, and get information um, related to how they can help their students at home. So again, when we look at our evaluation system and um, think about professional development for educators, we have to, again, think about that dialogue that happens. As I indicated, we have almost 80% of our families coming into our schools to, to, to be involved. But what does that engagement look like? You know, what is the link to learning? What are parents and families walking away with? And what evidence um, of that can we use in terms of evaluating our teachers? Um, and getting them to really think and value um, the, the power of parents. You know, our, our parents are their children's first teachers. And, you know, our parents come in a variety of shades and sizes in terms of their capacity. So we have to think about every opportunity that we engage with our parents as an opportunity to put additional tools in their parenting toolkit. All right, thank you for that. Um, and then here's just kind of a perennial question um, that we get uh, dealing with student behavior. Um, how do you work with parents um, to teach their children uh, to behave in class? Hmm. Well, I would first suggest considering sharing some of the same ways in which they get their own children, nieces or nephews, to behave. Um, additionally, I'd, I'd work with the parent to determine where the misbehavior is coming from. You know, when you do this, then you're better equipped to come up with effective strategies for addressing behavior. But I think all too often there are assumptions made about when a child is misbehaving. But I certainly would think that um, as an educator, there are strategies that you employ right now with your own children that I would highly suggest that you look at first. Tracy, do you want to add anything? Well, you know, um, my experience as a teacher, I, I worked in a day treatment facility for kids with emotional problems that were actually put out of uh, public schools. And what I learned as an educator, and I was called a teacher counselor, um, was that nothing comes from nothing. When students are misbehaving or, or having um, issues in classrooms um, related to social skills and, and, and um, reacting or not reacting or um, not following directions, it's related to something. So you really have to work with the, the families to, to understand what might be going on. Um, you might talk to the child about you know, how they're reacting to things, and then work with families to think about alternative strategies. In Cleveland, um, we've instituted, we have our Humanware program, which actually provides teachers with tools to help um, students understand their behaviors. We use that stop, think um, strategy, you know, where uh, it's called PASS, for the promoting alternative thinking strategy. So the behavioral learning is incorporated into the classroom because I think we've gotten away from, as educators, um, a belief that social emotional learning and academic learning go hand in hand. So how do we work with families to, you know, help them understand the rules of, the, of, of school and, and reinforce um, the needs for students to, to be ready to learn, but also to um, really work with our, our professional community around the integration, the need for integration for social emotional learning and academics. Um, because we, we've got to work with our families and, again, building capacity of our educators to better understand what causes behavior and then to be able to effectively address it instead of reacting to it. Thank you for that. Um, I know both of your cities have um, you know, large uh, populations of English learners. Um, I know, at least in Springfield, there are a number of immigrant families. Um, what are you doing um, in your districts to reach out um, to the, that particular population of parents and students? Well, we don't actually um, differentiate um, whether we're working with uh, students with uh, special ed needs or um, different ELL kinds of challenges because, quite frankly, the same issues are prevalent for all of them. And so, you know, through SPOB, we offer several of our courses in Spanish and other languages, and we conduct um, focus groups of parents who speak languages other than English, and we also are fortunate to have a very diverse pace, um, our parent and community engagement team and volunteers, and they actively work with us to implement our outreach plan. The outreach is usually 
what gets differentiated. But we also partner with a lot of different organizations like um, the Mass Migrant Education Program, the um, Office for Refugees and Immigrants, you know, Jewish Community Center, Lutheran Community Center, and um, a host of others. But what we um, pride ourselves in is providing these free resources in, in collaborating with them that support and help us support families where English is not their first language. And I would encourage that these are the resources that you should look into because quite frankly the resources, supports, and certainly the funding continues to be diminished, especially in public education. So we really have to do our due diligence around collaborating with those that we can partner with that have those resources that enables us to support our families. And there's a very diverse set of families that we're dealing with in urban uh, settings. Tracy, did you have anything to add? Yeah, just as we have a department that works with our 11% um, homeless families in Cleveland, we also have our multicultural and multilingual department, um, which uh, works with our community with several of our agencies like Esperanza to um, work to, to provide services to our families. Our multicultural school, Thomas Jefferson Newcomers Academy, was actually visited um, by a representative of the White House as a national model. Um, it's, we have an intake center for immigrant families, for homeless families. Um, we have about 18, 18 different languages that are spoken in the district. Um, but the students who are uh, immigrants or refugees come to this particular school so that they are immersed um, in the English language. And um, they receive testing at various points in their, um, their, 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 their as they're going through the schools um, with the OTELA, which um, indicates what their language learning level is. So our students typically will stay in the school for like a year to a year and a half, and then they um, are assigned to a, another school where they continue to see, receive language supports. Um, at our multicultural center, we have a, a parent liaison who actually does um, uh, schedules workshops for parents around um, English as a second language, so English classes, uh, GED classes, and citizenship classes. So. Um, that our newcomers are, are, uh, receive uh, the various services of the community as well as um, uh, being involved in their children's school. Thank you. Um, and here's a question that just kind of came in over the transom. Um, what are your districts doing to um, increase volunteering rates for parents? We, what we do is we have a, um, a volunteer office um, of which I have responsibility for that's over 40 years um, that it's been around. And so we have um, business partners for each of our respective schools, and in many cases, multiple ones. But what we do is we actually um, foster and encourage volunteerism in our schools and so by our parents and families and caring adults. And so we give incentives for parents who volunteer in their respective children's schools as well as across schools. And so there's a major recognition that we have at the end of the year. And one of the um, items that we recognize are the number of hours that a parent actually volunteers in their child's schools. And we give them a menu of offerings in terms of the ways in which they can volunteer. And what we have found most recently over the last few years is that we've come up with a listing of uh, volunteer ways that doesn't um, ask that the parent come into the schools. And so things like um, stuffing, folding and stuffing envelopes where we have a drop-off person that brings it to the home of a mother, single mother that may have four or five small children and can't get out or doesn't have transportation. And then someone comes back and picks those up. Or we have another um, parent who actually um, is a facilitator of having different parents bake goods for particular functions that happen at a school. And so they coordinate that, and we have food or snacks that are available for particular functions. So we've been doing a lot more of meeting parents where they are as it relates to volunteerism, especially with some of the challenges that we are having with uh, 
some of our parents passing the quarry. So we've just been trying to get much more creative than in the past instead of just merely inviting them in because unfortunately some of our parents haven't been um, made to feel welcome coming into the schools, some of our mm -hmm. schools, and we're working on that, as well as they just didn't have a positive experience themselves as a student in the district. And so we're just trying to be very careful to look at everything from every angle to fully engage um, our parents and families in volunteering. All right, thank you. Tracy? Um, actually, we have our volunteer um, recognition event at our Board of Education meeting this evening, so it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny that you mentioned the timing is perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's similar to what Pat said. We provide a lot of opportunities for our families, uh, our parents, our caregivers. I, it, it, you know, our families are comprised of so many different, you know, structures. You know, we have grandparents in our district who are raising our students. We have um, foster parents. Um, dads, brothers, it's, it's, you know, so we, when we talk about families, we have to be inclusive of all the different types of families and structures out there. But again, we do a lot of volunteer opportunities in our district. Um, we're working, uh, we, we have uh, community agencies and partners that come in and, and volunteer, but also getting our families to come in and having a very structured format for them so that they feel welcomed and valued at schools. Um, as Pat said, you know, um, we are rebuilding trust in Cleveland in terms of our schools. Um, over the last 25 years, we've lost about 30,000 students because parents now have a choice in terms of where they can go. We have charter schools. We have the scholarship program. So our parents are thinking about where they're sending their kids. Um, we endeavor to have uh, a customer service program um, instituted in the last two years as part of the Cleveland Plan, um, working with the Cleveland Clinic. Um, they developed a, a customer service training so that when our parents come to school, they're greeted with um, dignity and respect because that's a big part of engaging families. Um, if, if families don't feel respected or valued when they come to schools, then they're not going to show up. And um, you can have all kinds of events and plans, but if they're not a part of the planning process, if they're not a part of the community, if they don't feel valued, they're not going to participate. So um, providing opportunities for volunteering and being engaged um, in the various committees and being engaged in the decision making is vitally important to um, helping transform our schools. All right, thank you for that. Um, so I know a couple in, in your presentations, um, you each mentioned, uh, I know Tracy at least once, um, having you know an app um, that parents could log on to a grade book. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. the digital divide is, is um, a growing um, concern of policymakers. So I'm wondering how, um, how you and your districts are, are helping parents in poverty who may not have access to those types of uh, technologies at home. Um, and I'll start with Pat on that answer. Well, in Springfield, we um, have many partnerships with uh, pretty much all of our libraries and our community-based organizations, um, as well as um, opportunities through our Parent and Community Engagement Center, which is the go-to place for our families. And so we recognize that there are some limitations but we are fortunate, and I think most communities really are when you begin to do the, the research, whereby partnering is essential in terms of um, technology. And so we've even gone to um, getting some clearance around parents and texting things, because most of our mm -hmm. families at least have phones, and even if they're um, month by month, um, Phones, we're able to communicate much more effectively, and we realize that both students and parents, and a lot of our younger single parents, communicate in that way through the phones. But I would, I, I couldn't send more kudos out to our libraries, our community-based organizations, and most recently, some of our um, churches, our faith-based organizations, have really stepped up to the plate to uh, provide access to our parents. And most of those are the facilities that stay open beyond uh, our school hours or beyond even some of our community schools. So that's been extremely helpful for us in Springfield. All right, thank you. Tracy? Yeah, we also have partnerships with our libraries, rec centers, recreation centers, um, and then several of our neighborhood houses that have provide free access for parents. Um, we also, with the public library, um, parents can go in and have access to all of the um, the apps or uh, software that are available for students in the schools. So um, just 
increasing awareness around that. Um, when we talk about applications for smartphones, I think you know when we think about communicating with our families and allowing them access to information, uh, you know we are right now investigating um, apps for uh, our student information system um, and an online gradebook for district-wide usage, where parents can go on and see attendance on a, a, a like. Um, real-time attendance, go in and see their child's standardized, te standardized testing, um, and grades and assignments that are available. So we will be conducting um, uh, some surveys and focus groups around what parents would like to see in that sort of an app. So you know we're in the 21st century, and we have to use all of the mechanisms and, and platforms that we can um, uh, with the technology that our families are familiar with, and again, that's those smartphones and iPhones and, and, and things like that, and develop apps so that they have easy access to their students' information. And thank you for saying that, Tracy, because in Springfield we also have what is referred to as our parent portal, and parents mm -hmm. now have access to real time. And it, it's really been especially helpful in terms of some of the disciplinary um, concerns that we've had. So parents being able to see class by class at the high school level mm -hmm. if their child, for example, was absent or had an incident, and it has really helped us to minimize the level of discipline and the expulsions and um, disciplines in the high and middle schools in particular. So that's been especially helpful. Well, thank you both for sharing those um, app ideas. Um, so I know you're both, you both work in urban areas, um, but I know you're also experts in parent engagement. So do you have any tips for translating um, some of the strategies you've mentioned um, to a rural or um, suburban context? Hmm. I, I don't mean to be redundant, but I just believe strongly that um, the actual strategies and interventions don't really vary whether you're talking an urban or a um, suburban or rural district. There are, for us in Springfield, we've come up with tiered interventions. So, um, and we look at that from both the school perspective as well as the parent perspective or groups of parents. And so, for example, our we have three tiers, and our tier one all of our schools get the core engagement supports and strategies. So, you know, things like uh, access to the Springfield Parent Academy uh, courses and those parent engagement uh, 1.0 things that I mentioned during my earlier presentation or, um, you know, having at minimally a part-time parent facilitator. But then there's those tier two where um, they get some interventions. And then there's tier three that's really intensive, more individual interventions. And we have fewer of our schools that get those. But we've taken that same approach with our families. And we meet them where they are, just like we meet mm -hmm. students in the classroom where they are. So while we have a litany of strategies, and many of which are research-based strategies, it really depends on where that parent is. So a parent who, for example, has a GED versus a parent who has a master's degree, there are strategies and interventions that they may all need, but at different degrees and at different times, depending on what's going on for them, or even the fact that they may have kids over multiple grades. So it's, it's really um, a more tiered um, approach than it is different for urban or rural. And then I'll just lastly say one of the differences I would suggest for um, the rural districts is that outreach. That's a bit more of a challenge in terms of transportation issues. And so that's why um, what we do a lot of is going to where they are. And so we, mm -hmm. even through our uh, Springfield Parent Academy, we go and deliver courses in apartment complexes in the community room where parents come down in their pajamas and rollers in their hair. And we <laughs> subcontract with daycare providers so that they're having educational opportunities for the kids. Food is provided. We've removed all of the barriers around I can't get there, I don't have a sitter, you know, my, I have to feed my kids, all of those kinds of things, I think more of that probably needs to exist or must exist in, in the urban or rural areas and, and primarily because of, of those transportation issues that exist. Teresa, do you want to add anything? 
Yeah, so when I I, I agree 100% what Pat said um, in terms of uh, the rural populations and going where people are and and, and, and and again, we have to think about always, you know, at the core of all of this work is relationships. You know, so uh, building those relationships and going and meeting people where they are. And, and, and one of the biggest things that I talk about is um, for educators not to place value judgments on our families because of who they are, where they are, or what their conditions might be. Um, that when we think about this family engagement, wherever you are, um, rural, suburban, urban, you, you just really have to have at the core a belief that all families want the best for their children. Um, so the, when we think about our strategies, they have to be very specific to the people, the communities that we're serving. There really has to be an analysis of, of, of the culture, of, of the history, um, of the challenges. Uh, you, you have to look at the, 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 the you know, businesses, what, what's going on in that community, and, and who the partners are in terms of your libraries and, and rec centers and your governmental agencies, who can support the work, and, and getting them. We can't do this by ourselves. Schools cannot um, raise student achievement and, and create the global citizens that we need by ourselves. It really is a community effort. Um, it, it, I hate to, you know, <laughs> coin a phrase, but it takes a village. And we all have to, you know, think about how we can work together collaboratively, um, to connect the dots in our communities to really provide uh, a, a, an education for our students um, so that there are um, global citizens, that they can be successful. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question. We just have about um, a minute or so left for you to answer. I guess it's, this is sort of a lightning round question. Um, but how do your districts uh, define and measure parent engagement? I know that's a broad one, but if you can take it quickly, that would be great. Okay, I'll try to be as quick as I can. I think yeah, um, um, like strong parent engagement in Springfield is you know, having those authentic relationships, ones whereby you're able to have those difficult conversations because you've had several of the positive ones that preceded it. You know, that real strong parent engagement is making sure that communication to families are in family-friendly language so that we can fully engage in coming up with solutions. I think um, strong parent engagement is when families not only know but believe that if they need support or resources, that they have a safe place to go to and caring people that are going to listen to how they can help. I think um, parent engagement is when parents are established um, with parents at the table at the inception. Those partnerships, when they're being created, they don't wait and use parents as an afterthought. And lastly, I, I think strong, you know, real parent engagement is when there is strategic, intentional focus devoted on um, building capacity for parents to be real partners in their children's education. And lightning round to you, Tracy. And that capacity building has to be at both sides. You know, family engagement is a two-way street. It's our families and it's educators. And we're going all in the same direction. We all want the same thing. We want our students to be successful. Um, we want to provide them with the opportunities that um, will help them move forward. And uh, we have to respect each other because we're on the same street. We're on the same path. We might be on two different sides of the road as parents and educators, but we're all heading in the right direction. And how do we um, bridge whatever gaps there are in understanding that? How do we instill the, the importance of this work to the, the, to the people who are on the front lines? Um, and how do we get our partners and our communities to really um, circle around this work? Because um, when we think about it, you know, if our educational systems and our schools aren't, aren't, aren't successful, then we as a nation will not be successful. And we need to reach back and, 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 and get our families and get them on board. They can't be sitting on the sidelines um, while the game is going on. They have to be a part of the play calling. They have to be a part of the practice. Um, and we have to, all of us, work on building our capacity to make true partnerships work. All right, thank you for that. Um, and now we've got another quick message from our sponsor, Blackboard. Thanks, Allison. Uh, so, uh, and thank you to, to our presenters today. Uh, all that was uh, fantastic. And, and you know, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, Blackboard sees parent and community engagement as key uh, to driving 
success for uh, both our students and our schools. And uh, one, of, one of the things I've heard uh, both of our presenters talk a little bit about today is uh, building, the importance of building two-way relationships and uh, of opening those uh, two-way communication channels. And uh, when we talk about that um, and what that looks like, uh, there we go. Uh, you know, how, how do we do that and how can and technology help us support that, that goal? Uh, and Blackboard last year actually went out and conducted a survey, a national survey of K-12 parents uh, regarding their technology usage and preferences, uh, um, among other issues. Uh, when we asked them uh, how they wanted to stay informed and involved with their child's education, uh, we, we got uh, the, the five items you see here were their top five responses. And, and I think when you look at these things like email, websites, texting, mobile, parent portal, all, all of which we've heard mentioned today, uh, you know, it's important to see that these are all part of a broader uh, communication strategy and need to be considered for a fully holistic uh, communication strategy. And so we've, we at Blackboard have spent a lot of time figuring out how we can better support these efforts and how we can better support a, a, a holistic communication strategy. So, you know, we, we mentioned in our survey, we, we know that parents want to be informed and want to be involved. And we know how they want to be communicated with. And, and I think sometimes the, the, the problem for, for parents is that there are so many different places to get information that it, it's sometimes difficult to know where to go at, at, at a, a given time. Do I go to the website? Do, do I go to the, the social media outlet? Um, uh, it, you know, do I, do I wait for a communication from, from the district? Do I check my email? And, and so the, what we're seeing is that the, the gap between what parents expect and how schools are communicating, uh, uh, there, there's a gap. And, uh, you know, for just to share a quick anecdote, we, we actually had a, a, an employee who went and looked at all different places that he as a parent needed to go uh, to, to uh, find uh, his, his ch uh, children's information at their district. And what we found was there was over 500 different places at the district that parents needed to be aware of, which is just, uh, you know, obviously as a parent, that's just impossible to keep track of. And so at Blackboard, uh, our, our solution is designed uh, to help districts streamline their communications by, by bringing together all of those different uh, communication tools uh, under a single umbrella um, to all working towards a common goal in an integrated fashion. And specifically, our, our mobile app actually allows you to consolidate all of the information that parents want in a single place, allowing you to meet parents where they're at and allowing them to stay informed and engaged with your district on, on their terms and at, at their convenience. And so, you know, back to that question, uh, the, why, why Blackboard and, and, and how, how do we do it? Well, I, I can tell you there, there are many providers out there. You're probably familiar with, with many of them. But uh, there, there's really no one else uh, that's as uniquely positioned as Blackboard to present an end-to-end -end, uh, communication solution. And, and what this means is you don't have to piecemeal and go to you know, two, three, four different providers to, to help you deliver your communication strategy. But you can work with a single vendor uh, that has an integrated solution to meet your needs for, for school, district, and classroom websites, uh, mass notification, including text messaging, email, and voice messaging, uh, mobile apps uh, to, to keep your uh, district and your community informed um, wherever they're at, anytime, anywhere. And, and then also our, our newest product, uh, the, fir the first social media manager that's actually built for K-12 uh, administrators. And, and, and so what this means that when you work with a single vendor for these tools, uh, you're able to save time, resources on your staff, uh, and get issues resolved faster, uh, and spend more time working toward, towards what's important, which is communicating with your, your families and helping to drive that uh, student and school success. And, and so, you know, why Blackboard? Well, we know informed parents are empowered parents. And if we can help open the lines of communication and, and be there for our families, then we know that, that our, our schools, our, our students, and, and our communities are going to be more successful and, and be that much stronger. And, and at Blackboard, we're ready to partner with you to, to identify the specific needs of your families and your schools uh, to build a more effective culture of communication. All right.
Um, thank you so much. Um, we'd like to remind you, if you'd like to watch today's uh, presentation again, um, an on-demand archive will be made available through edweek.org within the next 24 hours. You can also visit edweek.org to find articles that explore parent engagement. Um, thanks again to Tracy and Patricia for your insights, and thanks to all of you.